Back okay, so we were looking at it helped out a lot. Um, developing relationships for momentum. And we said to start with, the definition of momentum was in fact a P, not a rho, and that the relationships was the pro are, the, are the product of the mass of the object times the velocity of the object and the hint there that this is really is a vector relationship is the fact that we have velocity in there because we've already seen when we started developing our velocity relationships that we had x and y components um, in velocity so that makes um, momentum a a uh, vector relationship we saw that by units um, it's a kilogram meter per second those are our MKS units and then if we took it one more step to our dimensional we've got 1M, 1L, and 1T. I told that to my class yesterday I said god that sounds like a song it sounds like a, a, a John Lee Hooker song, right? <laughs> one, one, one scotch, one bourbon, one, one beer, one M, one L, one T. Okay, so those are our, our relationships that we um, keep working with and trying to build some confidence and understanding um, these unit um, relationships. So we define uh, momentum that way, unit-wise, dimension-wise, and the expression for it and then reiterated the fact that they were, in fact, um, vector relationships. Because we're going to see, when we look at objects that hit coming at angles, that we can get angular deflections and angular components when the two objects hit and move in um, like directions or glance off in opposite directions. The next thing we did was we looked at putting motion into the relationship and proving that um, the definition by Newton's second law, force, mass, acceleration, also applied when we talked about momentum. So in doing so, what we wanted to do was show that the relationship force equals mass times acceleration Newton's second law really did in fact apply. Well just like we've done in the past, we picked one of the motion equations. In this case, we picked the relationship velocity final equals velocity initial plus acceleration times time and moved it around so that we could insert for acceleration back into the force equation. So the first thing we do is move our terms around so that we in fact have a definition in terms of a motion equation that I can put back into the force relationship. So now I have velocity final, velocity initial divided by time and we can see <clears throat> that this is really starting to develop a relationship that looks like the definition of momentum because just in doing that step by inserting this definition for acceleration into the equation for force now I have two terms that are clearly momentum but it's divided by time so now I know immediately that I've got a force relationship that is really a rate because I'm taking the amount of momentum or the difference in momentum or as we defined it the impulse momentum and put it into the equation so that I could come up with a definition for force and we said then that if this were the definition as we've seen before because we started off way back when with that definition for displacement and we followed that convention of the final value minus the initial value well I've got the same relationship final value initial value so I should be able to use a change in momentum relationship with this time that was introduced 
in the manipulation for a definition for time. So now I can define force as the impulse relationship for momentum, the impulse momentum as a rate over time and define the amount of force involved in the relationship. And this impulse over time really starts building for us the picture of a collision that's happening, an impact that's happening where I'm looking at right at the point when the two objects hit, which generally happen very, very quickly. And then before and after, they drop off. And so we use that definition in line with a picture to help us understand that. And the picture of this was looking at the amount of force involved in a, in a collision with some maximum force at this point here in time and what goes on before and after. So down here on the x-axis or on the t-axis is what defines our change in time. And now since we have a relationship that helps us understand the amount of force, we're also looking at that peak value where the force is the greatest in the collision to understand then the, the force that happens or, or the, the bad thing that happens during the collision. And since we can look at this with, the two, with two fundamental values of force times time, or for, force equaling momentum by time, I can move the terms around then and say, well, if I create the product of the two, then I can better understand what happens at that very infinitesimal point in time where all the force is doing all of its damage. And so from this relationship, this product, as we've seen before with relationships, if I can come up with a graphical view, lay out some coordinates on an axis, I can create something graphically that might be measurable. So the thing that we have to do then, as we, we illustrated the other day, is say, well, if I could measure infinitesimally every thin slice of a rectangle that occurred under that graph, and all, these are incredible, these are universes wide compared to what is really involved there. Because what you really have to do is take the width of one of these triangles or rectangles and slice it down to a, a rectangle that is smaller than something visible. So you're taking it down to an infinitely thin width on the rectangle while the length of the rectangle maintains. So what you would end up seeing here, if I could shrink these guys down, would be just the color green under there. Because all the lines would be so thin on there, the slices would be so thin, those rectangles, um, that they, you could not measure them from your eye. So if we could do that, we would end up with a perfect relationship of all these rectangles under the curve that I could add together, length times width, length times width, which defines area, and I could come up with all of those length times width for all of these guys and come up exactly with the area under the curve. And that's what, as we said the other day, calculus does. Because we take this irregular curve, defined by a mathematical relationship, and then um, do an integration on it, which is just the summation of all those values. And we would come up with a value here. Or, for our purposes, we could very simply say, what if I, what if I just took an average value? What if I just made a quick estimation of what's going on here and said, at the beginning of the process and at the end of the process, over some average force value, could I come up with a value of the area under that curve that was close enough for our needs? And the answer is yes. So we end up with just one rectangle that approximates the area under that curve and say it's the average force, hence the little hat over the top there, the average force over this time. So we only look at the beginning of the end, in the end, therefore dividing only by two points in time, and we end up with a value then that is good for our needs 
um, in this course. So the product then of the force times time then gives us a good estimation really of what's happening right there if I could take that very, very thin snapshot in time. So this is where we left off the other day um, in starting to look at some of these examples of what's involved in momentum and defining the impulse. Got to set this up a little bit. Have any golfers? Golfers, golfers. Okay, first thing, the ball. A golf ball. That's probably a little big, but golf ball is... about that size, got some dimples on it. Ever cut a golf ball open? No, but I, was, I was reading actually what, what's inside of it. What's inside? Yeah. What's inside? Rubber board and some yeah. the design of the ball actually. Okay, so in, inside of the ball there is a rubber core and generally, I'm, I've cut some open, generally there's that hard vinyl layer on the outside that has all the dimples, but if you cut one open, the first thing you notice is this long band of a very thin latex rubber. Generally, if you, if you cut through that or peel it all off, inside you will find some sort of core, depending on, on the height for the builder of the, um, of the golf ball. Some of them have soft gel cores, some of them have hard rubber cores, some of them have little air-filled cores, and they're all supposed to perform differently to give you a different type of flight for the uh, for the golf ball, but if you take a typical one, it's got a little, a little, a little rubber ball inside of it, and then wrapped around it very tightly is this length of a rubber band, what looks like a rubber band. And the idea behind that is it's wrapped very tightly so that it creates this core that is in compression. And if you think about the last time a golf ball got away from you trying to chase it across the asphalt <laughs> or the concrete, it becomes very apparent because it's got a lot of energy. You let it go, the compression inside of there with those rubber bands being compactly wrapped around there creates a pretty good bounce. And that's the whole idea behind the golf ball is that with an amount of energy put into the swing and into the collision, you want a lot of energy coming out on the other side, i.e. a lot of distance generally. Golfers learn to control the ball by their swing, by how much energy they put into the ball and the way they hit it. But the idea there is to look at a, and create a situation with the, with the ball itself that is going to react really pretty violently when you hit it. And so, in a golf swing, now we look at the face of the club, in a golf swing, you've got a club generally moving through some arc. And the idea here, the misconception of the late person that doesn't play golf and doesn't make much of it, is that I'm going to swing through very fast, I'm going to scoop up the ball and hurl it into the air and hope to get some distance out of it. And you would be all wrong. Because the idea behind it, the club is not a scoop. The club is not a shovel. The club is a bat that has been redesigned into this little face and what have you, and depending on the material. When I used the club, it was a shovel. It was a shovel? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. So you have to avoid the shovel technique. You know, unless you're right, right, right next to the, you know, you're in the, you're in the rough there and you're trying to putt out of, the, out of the sand and back onto the green. Then you learn the shovel techniques, you know, and the chop and, and, and what have you, those kinds of things. But in this, in this example, we're looking at the dynamics of what the club, like a dry or, or a good solid um, hit with, a, with, with an iron to get some distance out of the flight. Um, what's happening with the club face and the ball? So what the idea here is you've got this ball that has the potential in it for a lot of energy if it's hit, hit correctly, if it's hit well, and if it's hit with um, the right amount of surface-to-surface -surface 
connection, the collision. You want to create a, the, the right amount of momentum in the ball. Now the ball itself also on that hard vinyl cover has those dimples on it. And when we talk about solids and fluids in the next, well by the time we get to chapter 9 and uh, look at fluid flow, we're going to re look at the golf ball as an aerodynamic device. Because the idea on that portion, not getting away from the momentum, is getting the ball rotating in flight. Well those dimples are kind of like claws of a cat. You get that ball going, you hit it right and you get it rotating, it starts creating lift. And the thing becomes a wing of sorts. And those dimples on their little cups that are actually clawing at the air, trying to give you more distance. It's giving you the right flight, but it's also giving you the right distance. So if you've hit a ball well off of the tee, Generally, you will see it take off because the idea to get down range, especially if you're within shot of the green, is to get this guy up on the green and then what? Quit flying, right? And drop. You want it to drop and hit and not do any rolling because that shows your control of the ball. So there's, there's a lot of dynamics that are going, there's a lot of physics going on in what happens when you hit a golf ball. So what we have to look at then with all these things in mind for this problem and setting it up is look at what happens when we hit the ball now that the club face is right here moving into the golf ball. It's sitting on the tee and we are progressing our way through the bell curve. Okay, So we're moving along from the initial time when we started to swing to what happens over here at time final and we're looking at the average amount of force. So you're swinging, you're swinging, you're swinging. At this point, somewhere at the top of that graph, the face of the club is connecting with the ball. Now the thing to keep in mind is the impulse, that delta P, is going to be a very, very, very small piece of time down here fractions of a second, millionths of a second in time where we are creating the collision, the impact, the momentum so that the ball will do what we want it to do. So we, the club face gets closer and closer and closer and it just touches the tangent point on the ball. But the ball's not going anywhere. What is happening now, because of the ball being designed the way it is with all of this compression, is the ball starts to deform. So we're looking at a point in time where the club is moving into the ball and really starts to, if I can get this right, starts to deform the ball. So this side of the ball is moving. This side of the ball is not moving. These are all assumptions we have to make. With a high speed camera you would see that. In the example in your book I think there's actually a photograph in there that shows that. And you can see the ball deforming. This side of the ball is happy. It's still sitting on the tee. This side of the ball is moving. So through here we're actually creating some displacement. Just that one side of the ball is displacing. It's moving a distance. So in the deformation pro uh, process here, as the club then moves some distance into the center of the ball by deforming it, we are still looking at the fact that we are creating the collision and we're moving through this very quick interval of time, but the ball has still yet to leave the tee. It's still sitting there. Now what happens is, the club continues to move into the ball. The ball has deformed its maximum amount and the ball then starts to react. With a good shot, that reaction is firing off the face of your club, an explosion. As it says, the heck with this deformation, I'm going back to my original shape. It starts to reform all of those uh, rubber bands inside, start to push back away with an opposite reaction and this is where you get the energy then that you've put into the ball 
by the momentum, by the impact, and then the ball takes off. Again, if it's hit just right, it starts to rotate and then does its thing as it flies through the air. So for the impulse momentum, the first thing we want to look at is this process that happens very quickly so that we can determine things like this problem is going to show. Um, how long did it take for this process to happen? How much force was there in this process due to the momentum? So let's read the stem. They say that the golf ball itself is a 50 gram golf ball. It's struck with a club. The force on the ball varies from zero when contact is made up to some maximum value when the ball is deformed. Then back to zero when the ball leaves the club, somewhat like the force time graph. Assume that the ball leaves the club face with a velocity of 44 meters per second. First they want us to estimate the impulse due to the collision. So we gather our numbers. The mass of the golf ball is equal to 50 grams or 50 times 10 to the minus third kilograms. Initial velocity 44 meters per second. Therefore, um, since the ball was started at rest, the initial momentum is equal to zero. Does everybody see what I did here? Because I had a question on that yesterday. How I turned 50 grams into 50 times 10 to the minus third kilograms. A little mathematical trick that you can do with powers of 10 and metrics. What's K equal? 1,000. 10 to the third. 10, 10 to the third, right? I want, I want a value in kilograms because that's my MKS unit. So if I do a canceling act here, really, if I multiply times 10 to the third, times 10 to the minus third, what do I get back? I'm back where I started, right? So I've artificially created a kilogram in there by saying, well, I'll just multiply it times 10 to the third. And now I have a kilogram value. Instead of saying, well, I know this is 0 0.050 you know, as my kilogram value. It's just a way of manipulating the number so that I can get MKS units, kilograms, so that I have common units. Okay, so now I have an MKS unit for my mass. I have my initial velocity, and I know that initially the momentum was equal to zero. So I go back to the relationship. The relationship says that momentum is equal to mass times volume. Since the first one is insignificant, zero, I don't need to worry about it. So the final one must be then the mass times the final volume, or that 44 meters per second. So when I multiply them together, by definition, I get a final momentum of 2.2 kilogram meters per second. And to see that number doesn't really mean a lot to you other than you've just calculated the impulse, the final impulse um, for the mass and velocity for the golf ball. So let's look at the more interesting part of the problem. <coughs> they want us to estimate the duration of the collision and find the average force on the ball. So we still have the same information we were given. To estimate the duration of the collision and the average force on the ball, we're going to assume an estimate of distance that the ball travels in contact with the club is two centimeters. So what that's telling me is that's the time when the ball has yet to leave the tee, but has deformed a distance of two centimeters. Because we're going to assume that the ball itself is a four centimeter ball, and that the face of the club is slamming into the radius of the ball halfway, so that it is moved really two centimeters into deforming the ball from what it originally looked like. So that's an assumption that's made um, it would be difficult to measure, but you know, with, with, with the uh, high-speed photography, you could probably get pretty close to that. I'll tell you a story about something we did out at the test site when, I, when we were still doing nuclear testing, because we used golf balls, and it was interesting. So, making that estimate, I, I'm going to come up with a method to determine the velocity of that ball. So since we way back defined velocity as distance over time, meters per second, 
then from that relationship, I should be able to determine the amount of time, the duration of the impact, if I know the distance the ball has traveled with respect to the velocity. I can determine the amount of time. Well, with my assumption here that while the ball was still on the tee, it compressed two centimeters, there's my distance, there's my change in distance from its original to its final, and we were given a value of 44 meters per second for the velocity. But we're calculating what velocity? What's that little hat mean over the V? Average. The average. So if it started at rest and went to 20 to 44, the average is going to be 22, half of that, right? So that's why there's 22 meters per second, because we averaged it over this little bitty piece of time. That little piece of time there, there was a time when the ball wasn't deformed to a point where it was deformed. So that's what we're measuring. So this tells me that the collision time for that velocity and that displacement came out to 0.9 times 10 to the minus third, if I move my decimal, 9 tenths of a millisecond. 9 tenths of a millisecond. A thousandth of a second. Nine tenths of a thousandth of a second for all of that to occur. So now I know this part of the relationship. I just calculated for the duration of the impulse. The next part then asks this then is what is the average force? So the average force is really this value right here. So since by definition the duration down here times the force should give me the momentum, if I have the momentum and the time, I should be able to get the average force back. So the definition says the, av the duration of the momentum over the duration of time, well, we calculated from the previous step, that 2.2 kilogram meters per second, now it becomes interesting, now it's an interesting number. Divide it through by the duration, and I have 2.4 thousand newtons of energy that goes into that ball. You could go back to the, you could go back to the conversions in terms of, of pounds uh, and uh, determine how much in pounds of uh, force you applied there. But the, it's an interesting example to look at first the mechanics of what goes on in hitting a golf ball. Same thing with hitting a baseball. You get the same deformation. You know, it's a little, they're built a little differently inside of a baseball, but the idea is the same. I had a guy ask me yesterday, what about a hockey puck? Well, hockey puck's made out of hard rubber. Even though it's kept very, very cold, it's still reacting the same way. So the same type of mechanics is there. So we get an idea then of what all of these terms meant. Why this graph? Why this mathematical relationship? We see if we take it apart, making some assumptions, making some calculations on those assumptions, we can come up with some values that give us a picture mathematically of what goes on in a process when you're out Sunday morning teeing off that you don't think about. You just make it happen. Whack. Let's take 10. Just make it happen. It never just happens for me.